Mother Teresa. Uh, the stuff for Mother Teresa wasn't really loaded properly. Um, so, uh, for that reason, as well as uh, I just don't think I can give personally a representation of Mother Teresa that would not, uh, not be severely, what's the word, antagonizing. Um, I'm going to focus only on Johnny for the presentation, and then I'll leave it to you guys to be able to hear a rant about Mother Teresa. Um, <laughs> Now, Gandhi, um, in the terms of uh, service, nonviolence, all that, um, is generally considered to be one of the great modern messianic figures. He is, like, you can actually hear it. Uh, I was listening to sort of a podcast of somebody talking about Gandhi, and they talked about him as being on the same level as Jesus Christ. Like, there's a lot of people who see him as something. Thank you, Um, uh, Something almost divine. Um, however, history is weird, it's rough, so part of what I'm hoping to do with this presentation is give a broad overview of Gandhi's life, but also show that um, no matter who you are, you kind of get trapped in some, uh, some mires, some pits, uh, bogs of the day. Which is why I say that Gandhi is a very human messiah. Uh, we're going to be going over basically three stages of his life. Uh, first, there was his early life and education, and sort of the foundation of what that set up for the rest of his life. Um, his time in South Africa, which was actually more than 20 years of his life, but if you watch most of the documentaries that are available on YouTube, they will usually only talk about South African life for about two minutes. It seems to be a very inconsequential part, but we're going to see why we can kind of skip over that. And then we'll talk about his fight for Indian independence, which is uh, the vast majority of what people know about him, uh, about Gandhi and uh, where his image comes from. So the first thing uh, is early life and education. Um, he was born to a religious family, the uh, politician father, uh, who was actually Council Minister, I believe was the official title. Um, sort of a smaller regional uh, councilman that was sort of in charge of a small group, a group of people within the sort of northern portion of India. Because the one thing to remember about India, India is massive. I actually had a coworker that was one point I was talking to a customer one day, and he he had a very very particular Indian accent. I said, like, hey, what portion are you from? Um, he goes, uh, you know, just somewhere in India. I go, well, is it like anywhere near where the Tamil people are? Because that's what I'm hearing. And he goes, oh, yeah, I, I'm the region south of that, south of the Tamil region, which is like the southwest coast of India. And then my coworker immediately turns around and goes, oh, man, I love your guys. I eat curry all the time, which curry is from the north part. That's like somebody talking to somebody from New York going, uh, going like, I love American food. I eat fried chicken all the time. And then we're like, that's the south. So, uh, part of the interesting thing about Indian culture, married at 13, his wife was actually 14 at the age. This was part of a religious believing um, uh, arranged marriage, very popular at the time, still actually quite popular in that region, and especially in the Punjab region where I had a boss. Um, he, very, uh, he had an arranged marriage, he had an arranged marriage set up for his kids who at the time were between the ages of four and 11. So it, it's still very much a practiced part of that, uh, that portion of the world. Um, he left the law school in London at 17. Uh, and it was, yeah, it, the family he grew up in was relatively wealthy for the area he was in. So um, part of his aspirations is he did want to practice law. And he, instead of going to an Indian school, which there were very few at the time, and most people kind of uh, they were already kind of downstream British law schools, given that they, those were the higher education institutions at the time. Um, he ended up when he decided to go to London. Um, and because of that, he actually adopted many customs and beliefs of British life. And we can actually see in this photo, he's, he styled his hair, he's wearing um, a coat, shirt. You actually see a lot of pictures of young Gandhi wearing uh, traditional, sort of, sort of the what we imagine the Victorian British garb, the, the bow tie, 
ties and suits and whatnot. Um, he actually, for the first bit of his law practice, struggled uh, struggled quite a bit. He actually had a lot of anxiety about not being a good enough lawyer. Um, and it, it kind of, it was one of the foundational reasons for why he eventually left law, because he would attempt to do cases in London. He continued to stay in London at this time, and for just that period, he never felt like he was getting success. Um, and eventually, somebody actually came to him and they said, hey, we've got a case in South Africa. We'd like somebody who can, um, who can go there and help with the case involving part of the local population, because uh, in South Africa at the time, there were actually two distinct portions, and we'll get to that right now. South Africa, you can see in this map, there's the nation of South Africa, and then you have the KwaZulu-Natal. Now at the time, while this was being British occupied, um, that area was known as the Natal district of South Africa. Um, it was actually contested land between Britain and the Zulu tribes, uh, as well as the Boers. The Boers are, the Boer means farmer in Dutch. Uh, they were a bunch of Dutch settlers that had come into the area <coughs> that, were not with the British, but actually opposed to the British. Um, now, the, the Natal region was well known for having a bunch of Indian expats. There were plenty of Indian citizens who, which at the time, India was a part of the British Empire. A decent portion of them actually went over to South Africa, and that was the highest concentration of uh, Indians within the region. And that was why Gandhi was called in for that one. They felt like he could do a better job better job with a case down there. Now, very, very early on, I think, it was his very first train ride he took in um, in Natal. He was immediately picked up. He actually bought a first class ticket, um, but while he was sitting in first class, another passenger said, why is an Indian here? Or more specifically, a Coolio. Or the, was it? Coolio, I believe is the term, right? Yeah, I'm gonna go with Coolio. It's either that or Cooley. Um, Cooley, Coolio, I think they're interchangeable. Uh, but uh, somebody said, why is it Cooley here? And they essentially had him kicked off. And for Gandhi, this was a massive change. So for him, it was quite interesting in that he grew up in India, and that was pretty tough by territory, but for the most part, he just interacted with Indians. When he went to London, he actually rubbed, rubbed elbows with a decent high-level political society. Yeah, there were a decent number of councils and such within London that um, he was able to make friends with, and actually, looking like, um, I think it was a Dutch, Dutch marquee from Russia. Um, it, very interesting relationships he built, but he never really felt discriminated in London. It wasn't until he got to South Africa that he started to realize this uh, massive underbelly of sort of racial segre segregation that was happening within the wider British Empire. Um, now, with being kicked off, he actually refocused his goal towards improving the standing of Indians in the British Empire. This was, um, I, the first time he got kicked off, he actually went home and he was like, what, what is happening? What, this isn't like the London I know. This isn't the Britain I know. And so he actually, over the course of next week, would continue to go back on the train just to see if they would kick him off again. <laughs> he was purposefully going back to be like, kick me off this time. <laughs> Um, but it's kind of interesting um, because that's also the beginning of Gandhi's political life. This was where he started not just to be involved as a lawyer, but as an activist, uh, specifically an anti-colonial activist, as well as uh, engaging in his primary anti-racism uh, <coughs> life. Um, the, the big divide there, why I say that he adopted a lot of British culture is that his objection to what was happening in South Africa is he said, this is not the Britain I know. This is some offshoot of Britain. Some people have corrupted what I know of Britain. He held, he held British life in very, very high regard. So there is kind of a contention that happens in South Africa of whether or not he was motivated by uh, the drive of, um, what is it, brotherhood with his fellow people or more uh, a disconnect, uh, a cognitive dissonance between what he understood Britain to be and what he was actually seeing. So, 
There's a second portion here, we'll get to that in a moment, because we're first going to go to the fight for Indian independence, his most well-known portion of his life. And here is where we get the Gandhi we actually know. So <coughs> that image you can see there, that is him in the Salt March, probably one of the most famous protests to ever happen in the world, and certainly the most famous one that he was involved with. Not the most successful, but absolutely the most well-known. And you can see he's now wearing um, his white shawl, his, um, his, what is it? I can't remember the official term, but it's essentially the, the clothing that was worn by those in poverty in India. He actually, up until he got back to India, he did continue to wear suits and such. He still considered himself to be a British gentleman. It wasn't until he got back to India that he decided to take on sort of um, the, the culture of the poor to better align himself with that. Which some people say was kind of a, nowadays, nowadays some people say that that was kind of insulting. <laughs> that essentially this rich guy comes in and goes like, I, I'm, I'm one of you. <laughs> but it was absolutely uh, affectatious. It was very, very effective. Um, so, one of the first things he did when he actually returned to India is he joined the Indian National Congress. Now, the uh, Indian National Congress was actually a nationalist movement that was happening in, in India at the time. But specifically, they wanted dominion status from Britain, but we'll get to that in a moment. <coughs> now, over the course of his time in India, he actually engaged in several periods of resistance. Um, it's kind of easy that like there's a general notion that it was all one elongated thing. There's actually stochastic elements. Um, there would be points where he would uh, push for independence and then he'd kind of chill out and work the political game of making connections and such, and then go for another uh, high point of resistance. The first major one was the charka or spinning wheel movement, and this one it was uh, there was a particular notion passed within, uh, by the Viceroy, I believe, that essentially introduced a new tax on linens, as well as tried to force out Indian labor from, uh, from, textile, from the textile industry. And um, Gandhi essentially made the call of stop buying British, uh, British clothes, stop making British clothes, we need to start making our own clothes, and it became sort of a national movement of people would get up, they'd spend two hours a day just sort of spinning their own yarn and making their own clothes mm -hmm. as a way of separating themselves from British life. Um, <clears throat> the next big one was the Salt March, and again, this is the most famous one. This is the one that um, was, was a massive inspiration for the civil rights movement here in the United States, in that specifically there was a law that was passed that essentially it was increased the price for salt as well as limited who could actually gain access to the salt. Um, Gandhi's response was essentially to gather up more than, I think it was 15,000 people, and they led a 300 kilometer march, or roughly a 220 mile march, to, um, to what is it? It was a, a storage facility for salt that was controlled by the British. And this was where famously the non-violence portion of Gandhi's movements came in. Um, in that when they got to the facility, they would simply walk up to the barricade and then the British would respond by taking their clubs and beating them. And Gandhi was very adamant in telling his people, no matter what they do to beat you, do not respond. Just keep trying to grab the, the salt. Just keep walking forward, there's like, 45 of you for every one of them. You keep walking, you're gonna to get to the salt, we'll be able to get it and get out. <laughs> um, so, again, the very famous one, it's also the one that made Gandhi internationally known, because this was also captured on video. You can actually see footage of people getting their heads essentially caved in while trying to get salt. It's very graphic, but because those were the images that people were seeing of what was happening in, in India, suddenly you had an international focus on sort of this, this part, of the name, uh, part of the world that, for the most part, people weren't really paying attention to. I mean, at the time that the salt market was happening, it was also the time that Nazi Germany was starting to pop in. So a lot of people were focused on Germany, and then suddenly you're hearing news of uh, these people getting beat to all hell 
and seeing footage of some really, really graphic stuff. So people started caring at that point. Um, the third major one was the Quit India movement. Now this one didn't happen until 19, I want to say 44. It was essentially partway through uh, World War II, where at that point, um, India had actually been involved with World War II. But that was a highly contentious moment. And there is some context to that. So in World War I, India was also, while it was part of the British Empire, was actually engaged in some of the fighting that happened within uh, the Western Front of World War I. <coughs> and for the most part, yeah, Indians actually saw that as quite beneficial. They were quite proud and glad that they participated in World War I. World War II, however, was a lot more scatterbrained. For one, the, the war that was happening in Europe, they really didn't care about it. They, they saw that as uh, those nations are kind of doing their own thing. Uh, the reason India got involved in World War II was because the uh, Japanese invasions of Southeast Asia that were happening at, um, within what is now known as Thailand started to bring a threat to their, to their land that they kind of realized, oh, uh, we got we to do some, otherwise they're just going to catch us with their pants down. Um, but it was part of that, and Gandhi was very adamant, do not get involved. He didn't want anybody to actually sign up for the war. He wanted people to focus on uh, India's problems and sort of keep it away from uh, conflicts that was ongoing outside of India. <coughs> now, I said earlier that the Indian National Congress was focused on dominion status for India. Dominion status is actually not full independence. Dominion status is an independent country under the British um, under the British flag. So similar dominions, Australia, Canada, they are their own countries, but they are actually part of the wider British conglomerate. Um, same thing for I believe, Northern Ireland, Scotland, they are technically their own countries, but they're part of the, uh, the wider conglomerate actually have and Ireland and Scotland actually have voting power within the United Kingdom, whereas in Canada, Australia, they do not. Um, this is what they were actually hoping for, for most of it. It wasn't until the Quit India movement that they started actually fighting for complete removal uh, from British status. But for the vast majority of it, they actually still wanted to be part of Britain. They just wanted to have the right to rule their own nation. They didn't want a viceroy in charge of what was happening. Now, Again, he was opposed to Indian involvement in World War II. Um, a big part of that was just he believed that if Indians were brought out of India and sort of put into a world conflict, that they would lose sight of what was happening at home, that they wouldn't have the energy that post-war is, um, some people talk about how post-war it's a very easy time to get new reforms and such through. Other people do. Uh, say that it's incredibly difficult. It turns out it depends. Clearly you have like the 1917 October Revolution in, uh, in the Russian Empire that turned into the Soviet Union. That was happening towards the end of World War I. But then you have like post-World post War I Germany that just could, could barely get itself off, uh, off its own feet. And it took like a decade. And the only thing that actually got it moving was one of the worst <laughs> political movements to ever exist in, in human history. So it, uh, Gandhi was just kind of looking at what was happening and realized, okay, if we get involved with that, we might not be able to fix anything here. That kind of lowers our energy, lowers our ability to um, focus on ourselves. <coughs> now the other one is he was actually opposed to the creation of Pakistan. Now Pakistan, this, whoa, this whole history is interesting because Gandhi actually made a lot of friends with the Muslim League. The Muslim League was a political party within India in um, that sometimes there were contentions between Hindus and uh, Muslims within India, but for the most part, prior to, it was like 1942, they generally saw themselves as similar groups underneath uh, British command. And that their biggest uh, their biggest problem was to be able to unite together and gain their own independence from Britain. Now, during the Quit, Quit India movement, towards the end of World War II, um, a, sh a, a, a schism happened, and essentially 
Um, and it wasn't because of Gandhi. This was actually, Gandhi was in prison at the time, and then some contemporaries uh, within his political party actually started being a bit of a dick <laughs> to, the, to the Muslims, and then the Muslims started being a dick back to them. And then it was a whole thing, several years of just them basically saying, you're the reason that we can't get independence. Uh, eventually, that schism led to the advocacy for a split between the Hindi portion of India and the Muslim portion of India. And that gained favor with the British when they actually acceded to say, okay, you have your independence, but the Muslims also have independence over here and the Hindus have independence over here. We're splitting you up. Um, which uh, Gandhi was opposed to that, and um, afterwards we can actually see that he was kind of somewhat correct because he believed that if you split people, they can't reunite. Once you put people in two different categories, they have an incredibly difficult time um, actually coming together and believing themselves to be the same. And the like decades of sectarian violence, um, essentially tons of border skirmishes. I, like I said, I had a boss from the Punjab region, and I never heard somebody hate Muslims more. <laughs> Um, because they grew up in an environment where, um, like, just people would kill each other over the board daily. <laughs> this is still a thing that happens. Um, and so Gandhi might have had a point in that, like, you, you put them separate, the, the shit's going to go wrong. It has gone wrong. Um, the, especially the violence between the Sikhs, the Sikhi and uh, Muslims on the border. Uh, within the Punjab region of both Pakistan, because it actually overlaps between the two nations. So, uh, but some people are actually quite mad that he was opposed to Pakistan because, well, why shouldn't the Muslims have their own nation? They're their own people. You're fighting for independence. Why can't we fight for independence? There's, it's all sorts of compli complicated. Um, eventually, he was assassinated in 1948 by Hindu nationalists. Now, this, this is actually kind of fascinating, given that Gandhi was a Hindu nationalist. But there was an opposing party that was very adamantly against their form of Hindu nationalism. Um, specifically, what, um, while Gandhi was actually doing his non-violence, non-cooperation, he was saying, don't buy uh, British goods, don't do this, don't do that. Um, there were other factions of Hindus that essentially wanted to go to war. They wanted to gain their independence by going and actually fighting the British. And um, you can actually, <laughs> I found several dozen YouTube videos where people are talking like, who actually gained us independence? Was it the leader of this group that wanted to fight against the British and scared them off, or was it Gandhi? Like, apparently uh, the other party is, has a bit of popularity. So, <clears throat> kind of a, a fascinating little footnote to all things. Now, Let's go back to South Africa, <laughs> because, and there, that is a fascinating book, um, The South African Gandhi, Stretcher Bearer of Empire, written by Ashwin Desse and, oh my god, Kula, Kula Bam, Bam, I'm totally mispronouncing that, but uh, those are two scholars from South Africa specifically. Um, one of them is, uh, African, one is Indian, because there's still a good portion of uh, people within South Africa that descended from the Indians who had come over over the last century. Now, Gandhi actually held some interesting views about black South Africans, and I can actually here pull up some quotes. Now, uh, a thing to note, there are two words that are regularly used in South Africa, or were regularly used in South Africa. Um, one is coolie, coolie, which was an offensive term for uh, Indians, and the other is kafir. Kafir is essentially the same thing as the N word on this side. That was a way of denoting a lesser subhuman black man. So, and just some quotes from Gandhi. Uh, it was a gross injustice to seek to place Indians in the same class as the Kafirs. Um, let's see. Boer leaders should not consider Indians as being on the same level as Kafirs. The Boer mind refused to recognize the evident and sharp distinctions that uh, undoubtedly exist between British Indians and the Kafir races. 
Um, where's the, yeah. He has even denied the not always obvious privilege of riding in the same municipal tram cars and government railway carriages as his fellow, uh, his white fellow colonists. His children are afforded no facilities for education except they attend the schools set apart for confers. So, and there's, there's a lot here. There are a lot of points. And these are not, these are not like he first got to India. You can actually see there, some of these quotes are from up to 1913. He left South Africa in 1914. So these were generally views that he continued to espouse um, throughout the whole place. Now, an actual examination, there is one where he, did, uh, there is a passage, it's not on this page, where he describes that what he was hoping for was actually not equality between Indians and the British. He actually believed the hierarchy was that the British should be on the top, the Indians, because they are, they come from the same, and I quote, Aryan race, uh, <coughs> that they should be considered above the Africans, but below, uh, below the white British man. And this, these were views that he held for a decent portion of his life. And there's a reason at the very beginning that I showed um, this photo. This has been going on for about the last decade in South Africa, um, while Gandhi is incredibly popular in India. He is not very well liked in South Africa. There are many people who believe that Gandhi was essentially one of the reasons why apartheid lasted as long as it did. Which is quite fascinating given that Nelson Mandela was actually considered him to be very, very important for South African independence. Now, these are not actually contradictory. Um, now, the thing is, he volunteered in the British forces during several conflicts, including against the Zulu. So I said that Natal was um, sort of contested Zulu land. Uh, there was a point where the Boers and the Zulus had fought the British Empire, uh, and Gandhi actually volunteered to serve with the British at that point. Now, he didn't, um, he wasn't a frontline combatant. He was actually a stretcher bearer. So his job was to go onto the battlefield, pick up uh, wounded men, corpses, and uh, bring them back to the camps. Now, uh, some, some have used that to sort of say that Gandhi was actually in question of his nonviolence when, because when war happened, especially in World War I, he volunteered to join the armed forces. Uh, some people thought that his nonviolence was more political, uh, political expediency and uh, like media playing than it is an actual principle. Uh, the other thing is he started his vow of celibacy at 38. So a decent portion of his time, he was actually celibate. Um, the funny thing about that is he was 38, while he was in South Africa, his wife wasn't with him in South Africa. So for the 20 years he was in South Africa, his wife still lived in India. So he went to London, went from London to South Africa, and then just like didn't see his wife by that point at about uh, 17 years, and then just sort of said, ah, "Sound to see, I'm done with done with sex." Um, and the funny thing, his his justification for it was that. His father died while he was having sex with his wife when he was very young. And for him, that was, he always, he said he felt guilty about that. As if by him having sex, uh, it, like, he reneged on his duties and his father died as a result. Uh, and, and the documentary does not say that. Like, when he was dying, he saw his father dying. And that moment when his dad's soul he felt that he wants to be with his wife right now, and that was it. Which is very weird. It's, his father had been dying for like several months. Yeah. And Gandhi was a caretaker. Like yeah. Gandhi was helping his father. Yeah, that's what really was well. mentioned in the documentary that was posted. Yeah, there's, there's some contention over uh, how much of that is Gandhi making the, because Gandhi mostly wrote about it like, decades after the actual event happened, so uh, people don't know how accurate all of the reports are. Um, now, uh, and then the other thing, so the, the other thing with the vow of celibacy, 
Um, after Gandhi's death, we actually got access to his journals, and people found out that he conducted what he called experiments with his celibacy. And this has been, a lot of people have heard about this and kind of gone like, what? So after his wife died, he wanted to test how strong he was with the celibacy, and so every now and then he would actually ask his grand nieces to sleep with him naked in order to see if he would touch them. And his doctor knew about it, and his doctor also has writings talking about the experiments. And I don't know, weird. Very, very weird. Um, but, and that's all I have for the slides, the overall point of this is that I would still argue that Gandhi is absolutely um, somebody that deserves an immense amount of respect. The guy went to jail seven times during his um, during his fight for independence. The man, he absolutely was a man of conviction. He knew what he wanted, he was going to get it, and he was gonna keep working at it, no matter what. Um, and even within his own party, he got into contentious arguments with people in his own political party all the time. People would have telling him, dude, yeah, you're just getting our people hurt, you can't do this, nonviolence isn't working, and he stuck to his guns. And the, the effects obviously worked. India does have its independence, and Gandhi is a massive player within that. So to say that the, the weird stuff that happened, well, especially like his racist views that he held in South Africa, um, by the time India gained its independence in like 40, 46, um, African American uh, civil rights members, like the very, very early stages of that, were making their way to India to talk to Gandhi. And he was the, he actually told them the next great uh, liberation movement will be uh, African Americans in the United States. So somewhere along the way, Gandhi kind of got smacked upside the head and told like, hey, you can't be saying this about black people. He kind of went for it. He did figure it out. But it, for about 20 years, it was kind of a holding back in a part of the reason they kind of skip over the documentary and say that it, like, oh, Gandhi was in South Africa and that's where he started to do civil, uh, civil advocacy and anti-colonial movements. People don't really focus on that much because they only focus on a very, very small part of that population. Um, so it is, South Africa is where he began to be an advocate, but it's also, he didn't really get the picture. It took him a little bit uh, when he got back to India to go like, oh, no, okay, I know what I'm doing now. So um, he's very human, and I think that's that's an important part. Um, all these flaws that he has, for, for me, that's not to go like, yeah, yeah, I mean, he's a bad guy, but I think the best way to respect somebody is to know as much as you can about them to kind of see their flaws, see their foibles, and go like, you know what, you, you still did a good job regardless. Like, I don't think Gandhi was a bad guy. I think, given especially that he was saying a lot of those things in South Africa before 1913, like, kind of understandable. I don't think many people here would have been great people if we lived 100 years ago. And I know that 100 years from now, people are going to be looking at what we wrote on the internet, <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you guys? So, we're, we're always stuck in that, that terrible problem of looking back at history and just going like, these people are terrible, and then not realizing that the, we're, the same is going to be said about us in the future. So. I'm sure they will say that. Oh, okay. yeah. We love that only in theory, but when it happens in real life, like, I don't know what happens to us. We turn to these, like, stupid, like, we don't do <laughs> anything, but it happened in the past. So why are we just condoning that? But maybe yeah, 100 years later on, yes. Everything we're reading about the past, like why, why did that happen? Yes, it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's everything about Gandhi. Now, I'll leave it up to you guys on whether, you, whether or not you want to hear a rant about Mother Teresa. Oh, God. I told you. I told you. Okay, he so. I wasn't sure. I was like, no, I'm sure your classmates would love to hear that. <laughs> I wasn't even going to bring it up, but it was, yeah. It was yeah, of course. No, no, no. Yesterday. She's like, it was to. part of the meeting. So. And the meeting was not there. 
But here's another perspective. <laughs> I, I'll just, yeah, I'll be, I'll, I'll be frank about it. Um, if Garmi is something that I can look at as flawed, a um, product that is dying, and still have an immense amount of respect for him, Mother Teresa is one of the greatest hypocrites I have ever known, and I sincerely despise the fact that she is still considered to be somebody worthy of praise. Now, the reason for that is because she never did, or she was only minimally involved in actually all the good that many people ascribe to her. Um, she was a foundational member for the Missionaries of Charity, which is the foundation that actually did most of the charitable work, but that's about it. She helped found it. She did very little of the actual work when it came to the streets. She did very little of the work of organizing the place, of taking care of the finances. She basically did nothing. She was an icon. Mother Teresa is a symbol, but even as a symbol, well, well, the, the people that she made friends with were generally, she would make friends with tyrants, despots, uh, criminals, would ask them for money. She would get money from, um, from all sorts of regimes. Robert Maxwell, who was a corrupt politician from um, Slovakia, actually donated a significant amount of uh, money to Mother Teresa, but in exchange that she also advocated for his political, uh, his political career. And this would happen all the time. There's just too many instances of Mother Teresa saying, I'm not a political person, I don't get involved in politics, all I do is for the Lord. And then showing up in, in Ireland and saying, like, we need to oppose this abortion bill because abortion should be outlawed in every uh, conceivable way, and we should outlaw contraception. And like, That's a political move right there. <laughs> so just constantly, constantly trying to play this, this two sides. And then whenever a controversy would happen about her clinics, so for example, people actually found out that they were not properly sterilizing any of the equipment they were using. So needles, they, they would use them, they'd go run it under cold water. Like, just wash it. <laughs> and they'd be like, okay, good enough, use them again. Uh, and whenever somebody brought this up to her, she would just constantly say like, I'm not involved in the day to day, I know nothing about this, you're gonna have to ask other people. But then constantly taking the recognition and praise for the organization existing in the first place and all the good it does. And then not to mention just the number of times people have talked about her clinics in just that they were essentially death camps. <laughs> not exactly death camps, but people would go there, they would never get the treatments uh, they desired, uh, but like they, they would avoid modern medicine because that, that was man of secular medicine. Can't use that stuff. We have to use God's medicine, which is prayer, bread, water. <laughs> just the number of people that would go and unnecessarily die at any of those clinics. And then just still say, like you're doing God's work. Done with your rant? Yes. <laughs> for now. Okay, let's give him a round of applause for his presentation. <laughs> Any questions you have uh, on his presentation or another Teresa that you're curious about? I, I did you read that book? The the one about Gandhi's time in South Africa? Uh, I've gotten through portions of it. How is it? It's, it's, so the fascinating thing about the book, actually, is that the vast majority of it is focused on um, what was happening at the time. So while Gandhi is kind of the central figure that weaves in and out of the events, a huge portion was kind of to explain um, like what was happening at the time that made Gandhi actually make the decisions so the people who wrote the book, they, a lot of people have accused them of just trying to attack the image of Gandhi, but they were, they're were they very clear in that, no, we're not trying to attack Gandhi, but we want to be honest about Gandhi in that he was very, very effectual in South Africa. That's where he learned a lot of the strategies that he uh, went to use, but that he was also extremely misguided for various reasons, um, and they go through like, uh, it goes through a lot, a lot of the um, underlying, like what was happening in Tal at the time, what was going on with the Boers, what was going on with the British, both in London and in South Africa and in India. They spent a lot of time giving you a good foundation of understanding, like the broader uh, conflict that was happening at the time. Oh, and final. I, did, I can't believe I didn't mention, mention this. One of Gandhi's personal friends, Leo Tolstoy. Yes.
And Leo Tolstoy was actually one of the reasons why uh, Gandhi gave for him being celibate. It was because Tolstoy actually told him that that would be good for him. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Okay, same as last time, I wanted to add a bit of commentary to this just to be able to flesh out some of the points that I feel like I didn't really explain too well within the lecture itself. You know, you're <laughs> you're there in front of a class, you're, you're just trying to get through the points as fast as you can, you don't really have the time to sit down and go like, okay, what, it, what am I missing here? Um, the first thing is that my knowledge about Mother Teresa is fairly limited. I'm not going to say I'm an expert on Mother Teresa. What I'm going to say is that um, of what I know of Mother Teresa, I am not a fan. Um, it, it, well, to be fair, that's putting it mildly. Essentially, everything I've heard about Mother Teresa, I just continue to find as a, a better reason. Like, just today, I, I read a story about how she would go to poor people and then hand out uh, medals which would carry the cross and uh, the letter M at the base of the cross and would call these the miraculous medals. And the idea was that when they were suffering they would be able to pray, use the medal as a form of prayer uh, as well as um, view it as sort of like a, a symbol of piety, a symbol of being able to understand that there is something higher than them that they can continually reach for and that they are not alone um i read that <laughs> i just go like okay wait a minute you're in charge of one of the biggest ministries of of charity within the world and the thing you're handing out to poor people is fucking medals okay <laughs> like there's there's just parts of that where god fuck when uh i might be I might be unfair, uh, because again, I'm not an expert when it comes to Mother Teresa. Uh, the other part is that I did, I did want to make it clear within the actual lecture itself that I do have respect for Gandhi. I think that Gandhi is uh, somebody that is is entirely deserving of the respect that he gets, but that a lot of the respect comes from sort of this place of viewing him as a messianic figure. He's somebody who is far above and beyond uh, what us normal people are. But when one actually examines the, the events within Gandhi's life, as well as the it's sort of the weird moments when you look over his South African life, for example, when you look over the stuff where, like, he just, in his 80s, was, I don't know, wanted to sleep naked with women. I don't know. Like, that stuff is weird, but at the same time, you realize there's a bunch of people who are getting off to all sorts of stuff nowadays. So, it's actually not that weird. And kind of this whole idea that Gandhi is something above the average human. I don't think that's a good image to have of Gandhi. Gandhi was human. He was just, it, like, he was essentially just like all of us, which I think is a very important point to have when it, it, I can speak from my own experience, the vast majority of people that I tend to know are pretty much, they're very self-conscious. And I don't say that to be disparaging. I don't say that to say that they're terrible for being self-conscious. It's more so that there's so many people I know that that have a capability to be someone who can affect change in the world. Like, legitimately, they have the intelligence, they have the know-how, but uh, half the time they just sit there and go, am I going to really be as good as I think I will be? Um, and, and part of it is just... <laughs> especially the social media world once once we're stuck in the world where like you could just pull up an application and then suddenly you're seeing like 50 other people doing their own things and they're like portraying the very very best of what their life is going through people people are kind of stuck in this trap of of constantly comparing themselves to other people um part of what i wanted to discuss with gandhi um part of why i think it was very important to view gandhi as human 
as somebody very, very much like our own selves, as somebody who fell into the traps of his own time and his own politics and was was part of just the regular human milieu that, that happened at the time, is because people really do need to have just this capability of understanding that they, they are not, people are not what, um, people are not the problem is, I suppose, a, a good way to put it. There are too many people that just sort of believe that they do not have the capability of actually creating change. They don't have the capability of making the world a better place, even though they do. It, most people tend to hold themselves back. When you look at somebody like Gandhi, who, for all intents and purposes, is, is like the highest level of human mythology, uh, modern mythology, I suppose is a good way of putting it. Gandhi is one of those modern mythological figures in that much of his life has kind of been put in this place where there was nothing Gandhi could do that would be considered wrong. Gandhi was perfect in every way, but an actual examination of his life would generally get people to understand Gandhi was not perfect. Gandhi was human. Gandhi had flaws. And even, be, well, despite those flaws, or even maybe because of those flaws, Gandhi was effectual. There are some that actually make the argument that Gandhi was as effectual as he was because he spent the time he did in London, because he understood the British Empire far better than most Indians would ever get the chance to. Um, so when, when we're talking about these, these people, there is good reason to actually like, look at them with, with not only respect, but a huge amount of respect, but also kind of understand they're not too different from the average person. So, I don't know. Uh, part of it is just I, I kind of want people to understand, don't beat yourself up too much. Don't spend so much time really telling yourself you're, you're the worst thing uh, you're the worst thing out there. Trust me, there's there's far worse than you are. Trust me, there's there's far worse. <laughs> but, you know, uh, that's just sort of added commentary on top of this. I um, hope you enjoyed it, and, well, I wish you the best. <laughs>